Hey everyone, I got to talk to artist, writer, and overall impressive storyteller Richard Fair Gray about his latest graphic novel, Black Sand Beach, issue number two. Of course, I talked about his inspirations when he realized he wanted to get into the storytelling and comic book business and other things that he's working on. So here's the interview. Enjoy. When did you realize that you wanted to create comics and tell stories? This is a, this is a, a weirdly specific story. I'm, I'm originally from New Zealand, and uh, back in the 80s, there was a store in New Zealand called the Toy Warehouse. And it was literally a warehouse of toys. New Zealand is not very good at coming up with, like, names for stores. Like, we don't have Home Depot. We have a place called Place Makers. Like, yeah, you make places with the stuff from here. We don't have Bed Bath & Beyond. We have Bed Bath & Table. Like, it's far less adventurous. But so the Toy Warehouse was, like, my favorite place to go. It was this huge yellow building. And there was a ramp up the side of it that and you could park on the roof. And... Um, I'm, I'm always like I'm still to this day obsessed with places that you're not technically meant to be like back behind the scenes at a mall between the stores uh, or like underground mm -hmm. Disneyland or any of those places like fill me with excitement and so the idea of like parking a car on the roof of a building like three or four year old me was like this is wild and the first time we did it um, we were there to buy a Ninja Turtles toy I wanted to get Splinter Long story short, my cousin got the Splinter toy and I didn't, so I had to get a Donatello, but it was that weird Donatello where he's wearing a coat and a hat, which I'm kind of in love with. But, because, like, imagine being a turtle and being like, I know what parts of my body I need to hide. Everything except my face and hands. Like, whatever. So, we park on the roof. We enter the building through this, like, little shed. And we walk down the spiral staircase and then we go across this catwalk that goes across the middle of the entire store. And I just remember stopping. And I mean, okay, pride prohibits me from saying this really, I guess. But what really happened was my stupid sister pushed me over and I hurt my face real bad on the mm -hmm. metal frame. Mm -hmm. But I'm lying there on this catwalk and I look down and there's all these people. And they're all buying toys that are based on TV shows and books and all these fun things. And it's all, every, every single person there is like happy. And it's also very cheap. So everyone's happy and not spending a lot of money. And like the, like that day, I went home and I made my first book. And it was a, a, it was a story that I called uh, Mickey Mouse in the Haunted House. So some mm -hmm. copyright infringement, but I was four. So I think I'm okay. And it's about Mickey Mouse goes to, oh, sorry, Donald Duck goes to a haunted house and he's meant to meet his friend Mickey Mouse there. By the way, the reason it's called Mickey Mouse in the Haunted House is because there was a uh, video game on my Amiga 2000 that was about Mickey Mouse in a haunted house. And that was the obvious inspiration. But this was about Donald going there. And mm -hmm. Donald was meant to meet Mickey there and Mickey didn't show up. So sad, Donald goes inside the house on his own, finds his way all the way to the attic and meets a ghost. The ghost is sad because he has no friends. And Donald is like, I have no friends either. I thought Mickey was my friend, but I guess he hates me. And then Donald, from nowhere, pulls a gun out of his pocket and shoots himself in the face so that he can be a ghost too. And then him and the ghost are friends forever. And You I, were a child. I, I you was, were a child yeah. writing this. But yeah, I, there was a lot of like, my, my, my parents were like, uh, kindergarten starts like at three or four in New Zealand, depending on when you get in. But um, like, so I, I was like in that system already, and like my teachers were worried, and meetings were had. Like, what is wrong mm -hmm. with Richard? <laughs> um, but I've just never stopped. Like ever since then, I've been making like like little books and big books and all kinds of books all the time. And I was always absolutely convinced that I was like just gonna um, somehow this would be the only thing I would ever do. And magically, it is. Okay. And horror has always been an element that you gravitate towards. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, like I love ghosts. Um, I, I wanted to be a ghost when I grew up. Um, I didn't think that part through, I guess. And like, I still want to, like, it's hard for me because my favorite thing in the world is going down a slide and I don't think ghosts could really enjoy slides, but, and I think about this like a lot, I'm sure there is a way there's one episode of the, um, not the good Ghostbusters cartoon, but the, and not the bad retooling, but the other Ghostbusters cartoon where they fought like a robot vampire whose name is Primeval. The ghosts in that could go into like ghost mode and float through things, or they could be solid. And I remember this really clearly because there's an episode where they walk into some trees and they're trying to walk into the woods and they just bang into the trees. It's like, that's not because you're ghosts, it's because you're idiots. But 
I would sort of think about that a lot. Like maybe I could be solid enough to enjoy a slide or find a maze to be a challenge, but also float through walls and play tricks on people. So like, I've always been absolutely obsessed with this idea of like, like I want to be a scary thing. I love like jumping out at people. A real good trick is if someone goes to the bathroom in the night, follow them really closely and then put one foot on either side of the door and just lean on the door frame. They can't see your shadow. And when they open the door, you just fall in at them and they get a big scare. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, like, like there's no better feeling than being afraid because like being afraid means you're alive. Like, uh, mm-hmm. right now the, the whole, I, I don't know if you know this, there's a pandemic, it sucks and I'm stuck in a single room. But, um, when, uh, right, the, the last thing I did before they announced here that like lockdowns were happening and stuff and, but like, I'm, I'm going to be honest, like bird flu, swine flu, SARS, all of them really made me believe that this pandemic was going to be fake early on. I 100% believe in it. I've been so safe for a year, but right at the very beginning, I was an idiot about it. And I was like, I bet the lines at Universal Studios are going to be short. And I went and I was terrified that I got COVID for the first two weeks, but I was okay. It was was all, it all worked out. I guess I'm kind of a germaphobe anyway. So it's this weird balance, but um, the last thing I did before uh, before COVID hit was I was walking home from my office and this car full of like people in their 20s pulled up next to me and they said, hey, Mark. And I was like, yep. And then I got in the car and they were like, you're not Mark. And I was like, that is absolutely true. But you yelled out at me on the street and you thought I was Mark. So let's pretend I am. What are we doing tonight? <laughs> and what they were doing was breaking into someone's house. <laughs> and because... One of, so this, this person had, one of the people in the car had broken up with someone and this person had some compromising photographs of them on a laptop. So they mm. wanted to break into the house to get them back. And I was like, that sounds like an adventure that has zero consequences. <laughs> and I was terrified all night long, but I had an amazing time with these people. I'll never see them again. They don't know my real name, but I, you know, I was able to be the responsible adult who was like, no, you can't climb a drain pipe. We're not cartoons. We need to figure out a way to like get in through one of the windows or the door. <laughs> but yes, yes, I like scared. <laughs> I like being scared. And the mission was successful, I guess. Oh yeah, it was. Um, It actually went weird because they had said to me, they wanted to destroy the photographs. When we got in there, they were like, turns out what we wanted to do was destroy everything this person owns and they just started going like buck wild on this place and i was like i'm gonna leave because this is this is a lot more than i thought we were doing and i don't know any of these people like maybe this person i mean you know if you're threatening people with compromising photos you kind of deserve some bad stuff but like Mm -hmm. i don't know if i'm super chill about smashing everything so i just kind of fled um and went and got went and got some uh some mcdonald's uh, and went home and then never left the house again. <laughs> <laughs> An adventure before going into lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> also, you said that you've always gra- uh, gravitated towards uh, horror and that stuff. So do you want to share any authors that have that might have inspired your work that you enjoy reading? Um, well, so as a kid, um, when the first, I, I remember this really clearly, when the first goosebumps book was announced and it was in one of the like uh, I, don't, I don't know if the rest of the world has these i'm just going to assume they did um we would get given like a like four four sheets of paper that had like all the books we could get super cheap um it was called the lucky book order and it was through scholastic and uh i remember seeing the the cover for welcome to dead house the first goosebumps book and i was so excited i was like oh it's a horror story that's like meant for me to read it. Cause I used to always get in trouble for reading like Dracula or like these weird mystery stories and, and like these old classic horror things and things. And so I was like super jazzed about this and I cut the picture out and I kept it under my pillow. And every night I would be like, I want to have a dream about a haunted house. And I would like try and talk myself into having nightmares. And then the book arrived and I was so bored by it. Um, and like, that's not to like, I, I don't want to poop on Goosebumps because I actually think that Goosebumps rules, but that first one, oh, it sucked. But the picture of the cover like excited me as a, as a, I guess, seven year old so much. Um, I read 
one short story collection by Stephen King that I don't remember this the name of, but I remember it had one story about a school teacher who uh, shot all the bad kids in her class. And I remember reading that being like, that seems, I mean, my teacher hates me, so uh, that, that feels really real. And that scared me a lot. And then there was another story about some like wind up chattering teeth. I can't remember what happens in it, but ever since then I've been like, chattering teeth are scary. Not sure why. Um, and then like, I mean, you know, there's there's plenty of good horror on TV and film, and everyone knows what it is. But like, those were those were the big things for me, like Goosebumps, especially because it was like you are allowed to do scary stories. Yeah. You're allowed to mm-hmm. scare kids, and like, say kids, cheese and yeah. die is mind blowingly good. Just the idea of a camera that shows you stuff that's gonna happen later, and it's always bad. It's so good. And also his uh, his habit of ending stories on cliffhangers. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. Awesome, I'm here for it. Coming to your work, Black Sand Beach, I, in my review, I was clear that I didn't read the first issue, but I was still able to keep up with what was happening in issue number two, and I am looking forward to issue number three. Now, where did the inspiration for that particular story come from? So, um, I, this is one of these things that my publisher always says, like, I shouldn't talk about too much, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> I, it, a lot of it is autobiographical. Um, mm-hmm. My, like, I'm not going to say, like, all the characters are very fictional. They're ridiculous characters and they are fictional. There may be some similarities to some people I'm related to, but it, they're fictional characters. So we'll just put that out there to start. Um, my dad and my aunt built the world's crappiest beach house before I was born. <laughs> Um, it is in the worst part of the worst part of the world. Um, it's a place called the Potu Peninsula and it's like, there's nothing there. You can't swim in the ocean. The, the beach is not nice in any way. There's like three or four houses. There's like a weird old farm and we're always told to avoid the farmers. There was like one family who lived there full time who were super creepy and their house was made of for sale signs. Um, and, uh, they would always steal uh, they would they would run extension cords into our place and steal our power when we weren't there. Mm-hmm. And our house was up on poles and like weird things like like a couple of times each summer when we were staying there, we had to like lock everything up and stay inside because there'd be a cattle stampede. And that's why the house had to be up on poles because we were in the middle of a place that the cattle would run through. Like that is how it was like this was our fun holiday place and we could only get one channel on TV and it was black and white TV and it sucked and I missed one episode of the Simpsons in my entire life. And it was there. Um, but there was also the coolest thing was the haunted lighthouse. So eight miles along the beach and we'd go there on our bikes or sometimes these like four wheel motorbikes that we weren't meant to have, but we did. Um, and I, I don't know the mystery behind that. We were always just told like, don't tell anyone you ride these kids and whatever. But we used to love it because um, there would be big like storm surges and the beach would get covered with jellyfish. And so me and my cousins would ride around on these four wheel motorbikes and just like skid through jellyfish to try and spray all the bits up on mm-hmm. each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, so the first time we went to this lighthouse, I didn't know anything about it. It was just an old lighthouse. And I remember walking in, uh, I would have been seven or eight years old. I walked in and uh, that's the last thing I remember. Next thing I know, I'm maybe 300 feet from the lighthouse lying on the grass. Uh, my mother tells me that what happened was I walked in and I said, everyone in here is cold. And I immediately turned and ran away. Um, about a year later, we got stuck there by the, we got trapped by the tide and we couldn't, we, you could go back through the woods, but uh, the woods are pretty dangerous at night just because of like, well, because a lot of tourists used to drive four wheel drive cars through the woods. And so me and my cousins would dig big holes to ruin their cars. Uh, and so it was dangerous to walk through the woods because of the traps that we had laid. And, um, <laughs> so we, we decided to stay in the lighthouse and uh, I wake up in the middle of the night and the light is on. And now this lighthouse hasn't worked for like well over a hundred years and it never worked well to begin with. And the light's on. So I'm like, well, that's weird. So I wander upstairs to see what's going on. And I look out and the light is shining out over the ocean and where the light is hitting, I can see all these shipwrecks 
and there are all of these people crawling out of the water and they're all screaming at me, why did you turn off the light? And I put parts of that in the first book. Um, but in the book, the Dash, the main character is, well, he's not the main character, but that's a whole other story. But Dash, one of the main characters is very scared. I, on the other hand, was like, oh boy, ghosts, I'm going to go be their friend. So I ran downstairs and I get outside and there's nothing there. And I was just so bummed out. Um, but so like, like I've always held on to the story of like this, there's something really cool here. I can do something with this. And there's so much weirdness. Like at this, like um, there was a lot of swamp land around there. And whenever the sands would shift with the wind, new shipwrecks would get uncovered. We would see UFOs mm -hmm. at night. There were the creepy neighbors. There were weird sounds in the woods. There was the sheep that we had like, like literally we hit a sheep with our car. There was only one sheep in the area. It was this weird wild sheep that was called Alabama. We, in the book, it's called Ramsey's. Um, and we saw it die. And then it was just back. So like, I don't know what was going on. The whole place was <laughs> freaky, right? And uh, I've always held on to it. And then, um, a few years ago, I was working on a series called Blastosaurus about a crime-fighting mutant triceratops who lives in a laundromat. Um, and uh, I was, I'd just gotten married and I was in New York on my honeymoon and an editor I used to work with uh, had reached out and said, hey, do you want to come in for a meeting? Uh, I'm with this new publisher. And I didn't have anything other than that. I was told nothing, but I was like, I've got ideas, whatever. And I show up and all my ideas, because she'd been my editor on uh, some picture books I'd done. And so all the things I had in my mind were like short picture books for like three to six year olds. And she said, we're looking for a series. It needs to be able to tell at least a hundred stories. What have you got? And I was like, well, I used to hang out at a haunted lighthouse. How about that? And I made yeah. up this whole thing. And I pretended like I'd been working on it for like 18 months. I was like, I've really got this all figured out. I know all the characters. And then I just like named named them after like friends of mine and dogs that I've owned <laughs> and like really faked it. And I said this one thing in the meeting, which was, um, I said, and at the end of the, whatever the first story is at the end of it, uh, the, the, the main kid will write in a journal. Cause I always did that. And I said, mm -hmm. he'll find out that he hasn't been at the beach for years, but then a journal turns up from last summer that shows that he was there. And I didn't know what I was talking about, but it sounded like a big, cool mystery. And, and this editor was like, oh, that's such a good mystery. Yes, that's huge to build on. And so everything has kind of come from me telling lies uh, in an important meeting. Um, and it's worked out well. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm scripting book four at the moment, and it's like some of the scariest stuff I've ever done. Um, I'm sort of trying to capture the energy of the, you know, the hitchhiker scene in Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. imagine if that hitchhiker was your dad that's that's what's going on in book four and it's messed up and i'm like i'm giving myself chills also because the place that i'm saying right now is technically haunted and there's actually a the okay so this whole complex was built in 1926 and it was um on this land that had been owned by this gangster who was running liquor during prohibition and the cops shot him on his own property and his widow went on a tr tour of the world in this cruise ship and came back and was like, how come America sucks and has no good clothes? And so she built the first ever mall. And so this is the first ever mall. And it's eight different buildings that are all different architectural styles based on the places she went. And they're all originally big storefronts, but now they're all offices. But one of the ones at the very back, there's like a weird fairy tale village. I don't know where it's based on. And there's like a like Arabian castle. And then like right across from it, there's a lighthouse. But the lighthouse is right where the guy was shot and killed by the cops. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I've been trying for years to get into that office. But there's a TV show that does ghost hunting stuff and there and there and they will not give it up. So there is technically a haunted lighthouse where I'm working. And so like late at night when like there's a big replica of the cruise ship in the middle and it all glows red at night and has a globe spinning on top of it. And it all shines in my window and I'm like creepy red light and a haunted lighthouse and I'm writing scary stories and I'm just gonna like hide and stay real quiet for a little bit. With the main series, uh, if I'm right, you you're, you also do short stories set in the same world? Yeah, um, so my whole thing is like, if there's one scary thing going on that you're focused on, 
that doesn't mean there's not a bunch of other scary stuff going on. And I really like, like, so, um, you know, you, you've read the, the second book where there's the thing about Chuck Mulchuk and the, um, yeah. and the, uh, the jars of mayonnaise. There's, there's that, that whole story. Uh, in the first book, there's like, there's the main thing about the lighthouse and the everything. And then, um, like the third story in the first book is literally like, Hey, what if that farm up the, up, up the road was like, growing these things that were definitely not the animals they said they were. And what if there were creepy changelings who could come in and replace you? And it's like, this is not part of the main story. Big mm -hmm. scary stuff is going on, but also you cannot ever relax. Like that's one of my favorite things about the series is that like I'm three books in and even by the end of the fourth book, book cause I know how long it takes for the story to be told. We're only on day eight of them being at the beach. Like, the first book ends where the second book begins and so on and so on. Like every single hour is accounted for every time that could happen is accounted for. And even during that, while the kids are out in the woods at the same time, like Chuck Mulchuck, they're out there feeding a giant monster in a cave underground. And the parents are having this weird thing where they beat the crap out of each other. Oh, that, that mini story. I was like, what is happening? Okay. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of was like, am I going too far with this? Is this like yeah. this, the scariest thing when you're a kid is like, what if your parents are fighting when you're not around? And I was like, but what if they became really monstrous and <laughs> broke chairs on each other and stuff? And it's it's dark, but it's so I was so proud of that one. I just wrote because, you know, as I say, the sheep dies all the time. Uh, I just finished drawing, actually, a little 10 page story that explains where all the sheep are coming from and it's a story called mm -hmm. the forever sheep and it's again chuck mulchuk finds one of the dead sheep and they go home and they go down to the basement and i'm not going to say what happens but we find out where the new sheep are coming from and it's so gross <laughs> i mean you're working when you're working with the editor and the publisher and you're coming up with these stories I, w I would imagine that, th were there instances where they were like, you know what, Richard, you're going way too far. This is meant for kids. Reel it back in. Um, well, the first book, there was a little bit of that. Uh, when I designed, the, the creatures are called uh, Definitely Not Cows. And they are, they're literally, they're like bipedal green horses with um, mm -hmm. turtle hands and there's like a human rib cage and a big swollen stomach and then a big mouth across the stomach. And uh, they just kind of march around at night looking for people to replace. And that was the only note I got was that I'd made them slimy and that was too far. And they're like, if you can make them furry, they ah. won't be nearly <laughs> as creepy. And, mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I did that and like, there was some nervousness and like, I showed the pictures to a lot of kids and they were like, I'm going to have nightmares from that one. Um, but then when, a, a, there, there was like a handful of reviews for the first book that referred to it as like, it's a little bit scary. It's kind of scary. It's scary enough. No one was like, this is terrifying. And I was like, you know what? Kids like being scared. Let's go further. And so yeah. book two goes further, book three goes further still, book four is going to be Buck Wild. Um, and like, you know, there's, there's a way to do it. Like, you can tell a story about, um, you can tell a story about a big gross monster with the sharpest teeth that like bites you and poisons you and then you, you know, swell up and die and it's all st scary and gross. And I can be very descriptive with language and like your entire tongue will turn to pus and whatever. And that'll stick with you for like a second and you'll be a little bit afraid while you look at it, you'll be grossed out. But to actually make someone really scared, all you have to do is make something a little bit wrong. And then no one can ever say that's too scary because they can't pinpoint why it's scary. And that's the trick. I have a story um, that I wrote for a horror anthology called Nightmare Theater, um, which is out later this year. And it's, uh, it's about a guy who's at a party and he goes into the bathroom. He's having a great time. He doesn't know anyone. He's made a bunch of new friends. He's having the time of his life. And he goes to the bathroom and he pees and he's washing his hands and he looks down and in the toothbrush cup, 
there are two corn cob holders. And it breaks him because there is nothing more wrong than corn cob holders in a bathroom. Because there's, it just, imagine why they're there. There's no good reason. And every reason is equally terrifying. But like, weirdly, nothing is more terrifying than imagining the host of that party sitting on the toilet eating a cob of corn. Because what kind of monster would do that? Mm -hmm. And like, I think it's honestly, I think it's the scariest story I've ever written. (laughs) Because I think it'll haunt people forever. When it comes to queer representation, it gets booked. Mm-hmm. Like the, when the target audience is kids and uh, and Chuck Molchuk uh, going by they them pronouns. Mm-hmm. What's your take when you're introducing such themes into children's books? Um, I think that there is a like monsters are always incredibly gendered in stories. Um, you know, you either have you either have like big strong scary monsters are always represented as masculine or mm-hmm. if they are like you know that they, they, they are he him pronouns if if the monster turns out to be a woman it's always either they're like it's creepy because they're like somehow weirdly sexualized in children's books which is always uncomfortable and awful or it's like a hilarious joke that uh this big like this this woman is big and brutish like a man and that's what makes her mm. a monster and it's it's tired and it's bad and it's lazy so when i when i did this story with chuck i was like i, I want to create like i think it's really interesting to have you know monsters that have actual motivation um because that way you understand they want the same things as you they just want it to be a different thing and so chuck's whole thing is they like the world Chuck likes music. Chuck likes scaring people. Chuck likes eating delicious food. And they know that if the world gets destroyed, all those human comforts are gone. And uh, when I was, I was like, what makes someone deeply human? And I said, making them like deeply, deeply relatable. Um, Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, maybe this is a bad shortcut for me to use for that, but I thought, well, I don't want to. I don't want to gender this character at all. I want to say that they like something because I want, like, there are plenty of books like for very young kids that will be like, this is our character Sam, and Sam could be any gender. You never know because Sam is an abstracted cartoon that has none of the usual telltale signs that are in kids' books of gender. Mm-hmm. And I thought, no, nah, you know what? We like actually like gender is a construct. And gender can still, like, we can still talk about it as if it isn't there uh, in books for older kids as well. And so, like, Chuck gets to be that. Chuck gets to be the most relatable character. Also, because I think, you know, I am trying to scare people always. And having, if, if you, if the, the character who I want to be the most relatable is the one that is doing the most monstrous things. I want Thanks. everyone to be able to say that could be a, that could be a boy, that could be a girl, that could be a non-binary character. I only ever refer to Chuck as as they or them, um, and then from like and and from, and from there on, like whoever is reading it, I'm assuming will like impose whatever gender mm-hmm. they are onto the mm-hmm. character. And I think that like that's a that's a powerful way to scare people. I also think that it's really important um, to just like I like I'm a I'm a queer man who who like mostly doesn't get to tell a lot of queer stories because I mostly work in kids books Um, and I think it really is like I don't have like I'm I'm a cisgendered white man um, so I don't really have a lot of stories that need to be told like there's there the you know I'm covered Uh, I guess is what I'm saying (laughs) there's a lot of stuff about media media. Um, like I, I you know I I'm not I'm not the person to tackle those stories. I'm the person to help highlight those stories from others. But what I can do and I think really does matter is just simply say like these people are in this story. The story's not about that issue. It's not my issue. Mm-hmm. It's a story about mm-hmm. they're like let's normalize this. Um years ago, uh, a friend of mine, my friend Kim, her uh her niece, I think, 
um, was planning her co- a costume for Halloween, and she, a uh, no, black woman from Zimbabwe, and she, her her niece wanted to dress as a princess and literally said to her aunt, I can't be a princess because I'm black. And it was literally that they're just like, it, it, like this, this kid is like three, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's, there's no nuance to it. It's simply like, she has never seen this in a story. She does not think it is possible. And it, it actually is that basic. Like I can put stuff in a story and then it's a thing that's possible. It's, it's like that representation. I mean, there's all kinds of much bigger, more complicated issues that can be tackled. But like the very basic thing that I can do that I think matters is put things in stories that people don't normally see. Yeah, sometimes it's just important to show that different types of people just exist. Mm. Like they're here, they, they exist. Yeah. Like Chuck Malchuk is a monster who goes by day and them and they exist. That's- yeah. For a kid reader, that's very impactful. Yeah. Even if it, even if you don't tackle more serious themes and all of that stuff. Yeah, and they, like it just means that, like, I mean, like right now we're at a point where anytime there's a comic with any queer representation, um, it is it's held up as like the one example of it, you know, and that's because by and large it is the one example of it. One example. Yeah. Yeah. If 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 we can. If we can just have it be like, okay, but there are actually there is actually like legitimate representation in everything. That that makes a difference. Like I can have like in Blastosaurus, um, the, the series ended uh, at around issue nine plus a bunch of specials. But one of the key things was that like I, I made the main the not not Blastosaurus himself because he's a dinosaur. I never tackle his sexuality. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the two main kids, there's uh, Tabitha and Richard, because I'm bad at names. Um, and like Tabitha is a young black girl. Richard is pretty clearly based on a young me. And like he is very, he's very queer coded. He's also a 12 year old. So there's no sexualizing or, you know, there's no romance mm-hmm. in his character. No. But like the, the coding is in there. Like he is, he is based on me. He's based on the things I was interested at that age, which is like, being flamboyant and weird and having cool clothes and making up dumb stories and all the things that like, you know, got me picked on at school. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, want to talk more about ghosts? Oh, you want to hit me instead? <laughs> cool. I'll come back to haunt you. <laughs> <laughs> I've always, I actually I wrote a story where, where literally that happened, where uh, when I was a kid, I wrote a story where older, like older dead me came back to haunt all the people that bullied me in high school. And the whole joke, and I was very specific. I named names. I, and like, I was like, I bet they'll all read this. Of course they didn't read it. I was a 13 year old kid or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but like all the, the, the joke of it was they all had terribly boring lives. <laughs> I would haunt you, but you aren't even worth it. <laughs> like, you're boring. <laughs> uh, anything that you're working on? I saw somewhere that there's this new book. It's called Cardboardia. Um, uh-huh. And the, the, fir- the first book is called The Other Side of the Box. It's one of these things where I'm not sure I'm not sure it's the best title I've ever come up with. It's just a word I've had in my head for a long time. Um, people seem to like the title. I said like literally the first document i have for it said cardboardia better title later (laughs) um i i wanted to create something that would be like low budget fantasy because like all fantasy stories are big and epic and whatever and i thought what if it was all kind of crappy and made of cardboard though and it all kind of grew out of there so i'm writing it with uh with my co-writer and friend lucy campagnolo and um it's about four kids who get these tokens in their cereal that glow when they're near a cardboard box. And they give the kids the ability to jump through cardboard boxes into a world where everything is made of a weird organic cardboard. And uh, what's, what's really cool about it, I think, and really fun is that like most, most stories, there, I mean, there are plenty of stories where kids go to a, 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 a fantasy world, right? In almost all of them, the kids go to a fantasy world and then stay there and have a big adventure. The key to this is that the kid's special power 
is to be able to travel in and out of the fantasy world. So the story is really equal parts real world and cardboard world, because I want to see how the two worlds affect each other. And because they are literally inside boxes, those boxes exist in our world. And like, there's a lot more fun to be had if they're able to be like, I jump into this box in Cardboardia, and then I find another box that's like in the same room in Cardboardia, but mm-hmm. then will send me out in like somewhere in China or somewhere in Russia, or uh-huh. and and they can co- kind of like the, the the kind of chase through the different parts of the world, and where where transit becomes really unusual, like secret passages in the game Clue, um, and it's really fun. It's, it's a little, it skews a little younger than, than Black Sand Beach. Um, there's a little horror in it, but for the most part, it is like a story about four kids who are, they, they have no idea why they're special, but they are the, they are the kids who are depicted on the board game Cardboardia. And that is a weird thing for them to discover once they're in there. And, and, you know, they're from, from there, it's a big, uh, let's, let's, use creative potential energy and ideas to power things and take down an evil queen and stop boredom and and like you know all all, all of that fun but it's it's uh, it's really cool so that's that's out in september um mm-hmm. and then and then i have like thirty seven thousand other things that are all kind of unannounced yet but but basically i'm the only richard fairgrand in the world so if you see something with my name on it it's me <laughs> Like, like I've, I'm, I've been doing this a long time. I published my first book when I was seven, and I have, like, 230-something published titles at this point. And most of them were in New Zealand, so, like, no one in the rest of the world has heard of them. But they're all out there. Most of them are about ghosts. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> what, are you binge-watching something while you're in quarantine? Uh, what have I watched lately? Um... Oh, I I watched I watched all four seasons of The Good Place this weekend. Mm, yeah, that's a good show. Mm. Every, I, yeah, everyone else is like a year and a half ahead of me on it or whatever. I was, I was like simultaneously really impressed with how well they handled it, and constantly annoyed that they weren't like I was like, it's a network TV show. They're never going to be able to do it that well. Oh, they did it better than I thought, but still not as well as they could have. You know, and and it's it's a little <laughs> bit like. A lot of shows like that, like The Office or Superstore, where it's like, maybe let's really take a knife to the corporate system. Um, oh, you can't because you've got sponsorship deals with products yeah. that are available mm-hmm. at Walmart? Okay, cool. I get it. But like, I'm glad you're pushing it as hard as you can. Um, and I'm, I've, I just I just this morning started... Uh, actually, I'll tell you the thing that upset me about The Good Place. And this is very petty of me. But I have been saying for about a year and a half now anytime i get annoyed by someone i say eat my farts and i really thought that i was like making that my catchphrase i've been signing off internet comments with it all over the show <laughs> my username on playstation has it in there and then in like the second to last episode of the good place bad janet as she's leaving says eat my farts I'm like, oh damn it Damn it. Okay. Well, I mean, it's still good. It's still a quality way of insulting someone. Um, I've always looked for, I, I like looking for good insults. There was a, 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 a running thing in these math textbooks that we had in high school where they had funny little characters who'd have like insulting conversations with each other. And th- they made no sense and they had nothing to do with math. They were just in there, I guess, to make the books more enjoyable for kids. And uh, one of them, I'll never forget this picture, was these two people, and one says, why don't you like me? And the other person says, because you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny. <laughs> like, what is that? Why? Like, it's so good, though. Like, not only do you dress poorly, but you're also dressed by your mother, you gross adult. Like, it's so good. Um, so, what, I, yeah, so I watched, watched The Good Place. I just started watching The Hollow. I'm like one episode in. And it's like, I think that might be really good. I'm not sure. It seems like it's going somewhere cool to start. I just finished Legend of Korra. Again, I'm very behind oh. on everything mm-hmm. because I only ever watch mm-hmm. TV like while I'm working. And so I can't watch anything that is like too good or too exciting because then I'll get distracted. Mm-hmm. From mm-hmm. So yeah, ter- terrible. Like if you want some terrible out of date recommendations, I'm the person. It's very weird. Cause like, so I, I'd seen, I'd seen Avatar when it first came out. Um, and then 
uh, my my friend Janet is the voice of Cora. Um, so I was kind of aware of the show while it was happening. And then when it ended and there was the whole like, did this, was this meant to end in Kiss? Was it meant to end the way they did it? Is this animatic that we're seeing real and all that stuff? And then they came out and they're like, yeah, that's a real thing. It was meant to end that way. We weren't allowed to. And it was so like mind-blowingly cool. I was aware that that had happened. And so I watched the show knowing, like, I didn't know what was going to happen in the main story, but I did know that Asami and Korra were going to end Mm -hmm. up as a couple. And, like, watching it, knowing that, the signposting they do throughout and, like, the quality of that relationship is mind-blowingly good. Like, okay, can I, can I like, be the person who, uh, who congratulates myself a little too much on, like, how clever my idea is for a second? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to... Here's, here's one of the hardest... This is one of the hardest things that I'm, I'm trying to do with Black Sand Beach. Um, in the first story... Like, the lighthouse is talking to Dash. He hears his name being whispered all the time. And as you know from the second book, his name used to be Harry. Yeah. And that's, like, Dash has an explanation for that. He says that his name is, his name was Harry hyphen Gilbert West. And he didn't want to be Gilbert, he didn't want to be Harry, and he couldn't be hyphen, so he changed his Dash. But that's just his kind of practice response. He starts calling himself Dash because, as you saw at the end of the second book, that creature in the darkness mm-hmm. calls him mm-hmm. the one who can dash between. Dash. He's yeah. the only living thing that can go between the light and the darkness, right? Now, what I'm build- what I'm trying to build towards, which is several books away, which may be a, a bad idea on my part, who knows, but, like, and I'm not going to give it, there's no spoilers in this, don't worry, but all the bad guys are assuming that Dash is the main character. Mm-hmm. They are assuming that, that, like, they are old power systems. There is a sparky, electrical, elderly creature trapped in a lighthouse from a long time ago who believes that Dash is the, 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 the rightful heir to the power, the power structure in place. Mm-hmm. And that is, like, that is the flaw in their plan. Like, he is absolutely not the main character. Is he ab- absolutely not the most important character? It is several characters who are more important than him. He is just the one who is being given attention by the bad guys because they naturally assume the young white male is the most important one moving forward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to build to that. And, I mean, I'm also... I'm also telling a story that's largely about trauma because it's literally about a kid who can't, who's like repressing his memories from the previous year because of bad stuff that happened. So there's a lot of things going on. It's a, it's, it's like, it's, I'm hoping, you know, you never know if it's your, like the, uh, I'm signed on for four books by the end of book four, I'll have told about a 10th of that story. Um, mm-hmm. If I can get to where I want to go, I've got huge plans. So fingers crossed. Uh, fingers well, crossed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's like it's 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 so hard, you know. And I, I look at something like Cora, and I say like that's it's they what they did was incredible. And I'm not going to try and compare myself to them or in any way because my God, it's a mind blowing show. But like knowing that it's possible to tell a story that big and with that much subtlety built into it, and to still surprise people at the end, um, or have it still work even if it's not a surprise, because I guess now it's not a surprise because I just said it all. Um, it like I think I think it is worth striving for that. So that's what I will do. So issue number three is going to come out next year? Yeah. And then issue I, number four, the year after that? Yep. Yep. I would, I would okay. love it if they would come out faster. It takes me very little time to draw them, but there's so much else involved beyond the... Yeah, because you also board. write and you also draw. So that's a lot of oh, I, work. I, 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 I write and draw at the same time with this one. Um, uh, I'm very, like... I don't know. I'm, I'm very like in tune with it. Actually, the, the first year that I did it, uh, the first book, I didn't read the contract because uh, I'm stupid. And um, I thought I had to make a 64 page book. And I thought they wanted three 64. It was the, uh, two. I'd signed on for two 64 page books. Actually, uh-huh. what I signed on was for two books, each containing three 64 page stories. And so I came into it very relaxed and then had to make the entire first book in like 94 days or something um 
writing, drawing, mm. coloring, lettering, everything. And it was hell. You know, I moved into my office. I got all my food delivered. I didn't leave the building for weeks at a time. I didn't shower. I slept on my uh, this very uncomfortable couch that I'm sitting on now. Uh, and I, I went kind of mad. I, I bulk ordered these things called adult premium body wipes because I was so unclean. And now I have chemical burns from those, which will never go away. It was not a great time, but like I had the most fun of my life doing that. And I became mm-hmm. completely obsessed with the characters. And I think the book is really good, partly because of that. And so the second book, I was just like, no, I'll just do the same. I'll just live the same way. And the third book, I'll just live the same way. The third book, I actually had to like, I got deported to New Zealand for a hot second in the middle of it. And so I ended up in this weird space where I was having to like find places to make the book at all hours of the day and night. Um, but like, I'm, I'm at a point with Black Sand Beach where I can just, I, I know that if I don't know where a specific thing is going, it'll present it to me as I'm drawing it. A lot of the pages. Mm-hmm in book two were actually rewritten um i don't know if you remember there's a there's a page close to the end where they're walking along and it's um it's right before oh, it's in the middle sorry it's right before they find ramsey's and uh it's where andy finds ramsey's footprints and i, I can't remember it's just like some big it's, it's the whole page is just jokes it's just andy being a dick to dash because andy doesn't like dash very much because why would he and um like that page Literally, I was like, oh, I think I have a funny idea for a page that could fit in here. And yeah, I've only got eight pages left in the story, but I can, I'm sure I can condense those to seven. I want to do a page for this thing, and it'll be like a bunch of panels. It'll be very funny. And so I wrote it in my head. I didn't write it down. I drew it. Um, six weeks later, I came to color and letter it. And I was like, I wonder what this was meant to be. <laughs> It's not in the script anywhere. And I had to like sit there for like an hour and be like, what was I, what was I doing? And I, I figured it out and I found it and the jokes all land and work. And I don't think I forgot anything, but like, you know, that, that, the, this, this book, if I was, if I were left to my own devices, I would do four books of Black Sand Beach a year. And I would mm-hmm. do, I, I would do it for the next 10 years and then be like, and I'm done. I've told the whole story forever and then walk away. But that's not, that's not how, like, it's not how anything works when it's not just me on my own. It's, there's a lot of good things about working for a, a publisher who can make things pretty and put them out in the world. But uh, man, getting obsessed with a book and just like diving into it forever is, is something I miss. And also it's a very long story. So hopefully it will continue. And how has the response been? Like you have two issues out, response from the kids, from teachers who might be recommending it, libraries who might be recommending it or something. So kids are loving it. Um, like I get, I get very good responses from kids. Very good, you know, emails and things, and things from parents telling me their kids are scared, but don't want, don't want to stop reading it. Um, libraries have really enjoyed it. Um, the reviews have been the reviews from from people who like comics are really good. Reviews from people who don't like comics are like. I don't know what a comic is. I think this is good. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, uh, and, and I never understand why people who don't read comics decide to read comics. It, it drives me nuts. Um, because they always start with, this is different than a normal book. But yeah, of course it is. It's not a, whatever. Uh, the, you know, the, the truth of it is like, when the first book came out, um, I had just gone to a big conference in Baltimore and spent like days talking about the book and, what making the marketing plan and we were going to do like a tour of several cities and mm-hmm. appear at a bunch of libraries and schools. And, and like there was so many things and they were all about being in person. Um, we were, we were in free comic book day last year and like there were 50,000 copies of the, of the, of the Chuck Mulchuck story were in that. Um, and everything, I mean, and, and like, this is a dumb thing for me to complain about because there are many people who have had a much worse time, but like COVID happened and everything went away. And Mm -hmm. the first book was released, like we were told May 5th. And then suddenly on like April 10th last year, they were like, Oh, by the way, the book is out. Um, We just had to send it out from the warehouse in case we got shut down. We didn't want to like miss out entirely. We didn't want to push it back. So instead it's early. So none of your publicity has happened. And, and also no bookstores are open, so no one can get it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can sell things online. But the truth is, if I go online, 
I'm looking for something and I already know what I'm looking for. If I go yeah. into a bookstore, I'm browsing and picking things up and finding something new. And so we really lost that that push, and that was that was really hard. Like I I worked for a long time on this. I'd worked, you know, I'd, I'd I'd been holding on to this haunted lighthouse story for literally decades, and uh, and then it was all just just gone, and we had to kind of scramble. And the big hope was that COVID would be over by the time book two came came out. I mean, actually, the hope at that point was that COVID would be over by probably June or July, and I'd go on tour still, yeah. but obviously no. Um. And so having a second book come out still during this, and I mean, we're not in the worst of it now, but I mean, in plenty of places, it's still really bad. But having a second book come out during that and like, it's a it's a weird reminder of just how long it's been. And uh, it, 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 it worries me, frankly, like in, in a long-term perspective, it worries me that, and this is selfish, but it worries me that like my... No one, no one really, it meant a lot to me that you said in your review that you were able to pick up book two and know what was going on. Because that's mm-hmm. what I'm afraid of, is that people will not want to pick up book two of something if they haven't heard about book one or read book one before. Mm-hmm. No. And mm-hmm. so knowing that I can still get, you know, new people on board with the second book does, does make a difference. But who knows, you know, I mean also maybe someone will pick it up for a tv show and then everyone will know about it and then it'll work backwards and people will go get the book later but who knows i mean th- this is the weird thing everyone who reads it loves it you have issue number three coming out next year and hopefully by next year things will be different and <laughs> fingers all this cross like fingers crossed during this entire pandemic like let it be over already it's been more than a year now yeah yeah <laughs> enough, I, enough I, is I, enough <laughs> I will say, like, I, I didn't realize how broken it had made me. Because I, I was very much like, I'm a comic artist. All I do is sit and draw all day anyway. I don't need to leave the house. I'll be fine. And I was like, just keep my head down and keep working. And then um, then at the end of last year, I got a, an email from the Google Play Store letting me know that there was a new Crash Bandicoot game coming out for phones. Mm-hmm. And that's not that interesting. Except that I haven't played Crash Bandicoot since I was a teenager, and the uh, the the subject line in the email said, "Richard, your best friend is back." And I read that and I went, "Well, that's exciting. I didn't know that I was best friends with Crash Bandicoot. I guess that's <laughs> canon now." And so I, without thinking about it, went online and bought a TV and a PlayStation and every single Crash Bandicoot game. And they arrived, and I started playing, and I went, well, I'm not 14 anymore. I certainly don't enjoy these that much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was genuinely like, gotta save the world with Crash Bandicoot. That seems like a really important thing for me to do right now. And I'm like, no, of course not. No, I've never liked video games. What am I doing? A a, a subject line in an email said that he was my best friend, so I spent $2,000 in a day buying him. So yeah, I think like we all got broken in different ways at different times. Mm-hmm. A lot of us got to learn different things about ourselves, different mm-hmm. things about the people we are around. So, character growth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this was fun. Thank you so much for taking out the time to oh, thank you. This was this talk was about wonderful. your book. You're in your own lane and you know what yeah. that's good too we need independent thinkers we need independent creatives not everything has to be as big as dc or marvel yeah. like and frankly yeah, you're right what james tinian is doing like with something is killing the children that is a like, oh amazing that's the amazing book and it's coming back this year and i'm i can't wait for it like it's I, an amazing amazing book i am um, i i'm actually i'm in a very good mood at the moment because i bought issue one in la um and then i left it at my place here um and i went to canada and i was like oh i forgot to, i was gonna read that on the plane i forgot to bring it with me went to a comic store bought issue one again there left it there forgot to read it again <laughs> forgot all about the series bought the trade read the trade in, in trade form and so now i've got these two brand new copies of issue one of that book sitting in different parts of the world, neither of which I can get to right now, but still I can get to them soon. Um, 
that I found out yesterday are selling for like fifteen hundred bucks. I had no. I've I've never had good luck with anything like that before. I've never Sell them. accidentally Sell them. A <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it it makes up yeah. for the Crash Bandicoot purchase, which is good. <laughs> Something is killing the children. Apparently, it's selling like more than a hundred thousand copies, and I'm like, you know what? Good for you, James Tanian. And like, we need more independent. As I said, we need more independent uh, stories that aren't always about Superman and Batman. Like your story, it isn't from the big two publishers. It's its own thing, and hopefully, more people will read it. Hopefully. Yeah. Look, no, look. Plenty of people are reading it. I would love it if a million people read it. But mm -hmm. also, I keep making it if only five read it. You know, I just, I just. It's like out there. It. At least it's out there. Yeah. yeah, and hopefully, like, and hopefully it will continue because, as you said, you're signed for like four issues. Yeah, yeah. So, and who knows? Yeah. Who knows what will happen after that? I mean, um, so there, there will be, there will always be more comics by me. That's, that's, that's the good part. Going forward to. The uh, Carbordia? That's the yeah, title. Carbordia. Is it really the title? Really? It's, yeah, it's, it's really called Carbordia. Look, it's look, it's not a terrible title, but it's just that it it in my mind it's never been the final title, but it is, and it's memorable, and people will see it. And I'm the only thing called Carbordia. Although actually, I I googled it yesterday, uh, and I found out there were some people who who built like a wonderful like city out of cardboard for some festival of some kind and they named it cardboardia I'm like, that's fine it's just a of course it's the name of a place made of cardboard it makes sense but it's it is very it's very good like i'm very happy with that book i'm very excited by what it what, what we're able to do with it um and again it's out it's out in september i think people will like it <laughs> i look forward to reading it and reviewing it even though yes. it's but yeah yeah cardboardia i'm like okay <laughs> listen I really thought that the Sandwich. actual title. I I really thought that the actual title was the other side of the of the box. No, that's just the title of book one. And it, what's really funny is like, like, Black Sand Beach, um, was. That was when I first when I first sold the book. They said to me, "We're gonna have to come up with a different title." And I was like, "That's fine." I just called it that because the beaches in New Zealand have black sand, and we refer to them as mm -hmm. black sand beaches. That's just a thing we do. Um, I'll, I'll come up with like a scarier sounding title. And then I didn't. And so we went with it. And then Cardboardia happened and everyone started saying to me, well, we'll need to come up with a different title for it. We need something like good. You know, like how Black Sand Beach just really works. We need something mm -hmm. like that. So I think what's going to happen is when my next book is picked up <laughs> they will say like we need something as good as cardboardia and i'll be like cardboardia oh, yeah. sounds amazing <laughs> actually i would definitely have a book called fartland <laughs> <laughs>